Welcome to Building Great Sales Teams, a show dedicated to making sales teams tick, tick, boom. Great sales teams are not recruited, they are built block by block. Let's get to work. Um, how, how's your team doing? How, how have your sales been? Crazy. Yeah? Crazy. Since I've been back, dude, it's been like on average two a day. Nice. I'd say, I mean, some of them are three to three in a day. Some of them are just one, but like on average, Did you have to come back for that when you left, they weren't able to maintain or what? The thing is is that it's, it, yeah. I think what happened is I, I set up this competition and that's something Mm -hmm. we can even talk about in this, in this, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, in the podcast. So I set up this competition. We're recording already, dude. Oh, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> usually there's some sort of introduction like, Hey, where are you know? Yeah. I'll <laughs> give an intro. <laughs> I'll totally give bad. an intro, but I like to get the crap before too. Cause sometimes it's gold. Yeah, for sure. No, uh, I set up a competition. Basically we did a draft, so it was cool. So we basically had two team captains on each team mm-hmm. and it was so much fun. We basically did this thing where we're, where it's like, okay, so, uh, you know, okay. You pick first, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, you yeah, get got you. leads and stuff. So we're splitting up the leads 50, 50, the online leads, but you could pick either, you know, do you want a, a lead setter or do you want another closer? Or do you want somebody who's, who's, uh, uh, you know, so, you know on the support side or whatever. Right. So mm-hmm. we were basically, you know, help, we were kind of doing that, you know, help each other out and, and and pick a team and, you know, pick your guy and all that Drama. stuff too. Yeah. And one was like, <laughs> Oh, well, this guy speaks Spanish. So let's do this, you know, or this guy's working really hard. I guarantee they're going to be really good. You know, that's kind of how it was. And we, we also have a thing of where we can recruit our own guys, right. Mm-hmm. To build the team. But if the team recruits them, then we, mm-hmm. we go back and forth. Right. So if, if, if the, you know, it comes, they come in through indeed, Mm-hmm. it goes you know one goes to team annihilators the other right. goes to team bulls right? right so yeah and we have like team names and stuff like that and that has been really exciting it's fired everybody up and so me coming back and like kind of sitting down with everybody and saying guys like i need you guys to take this seriously this yeah, is that's if, how you execute this, on it yeah this competition won't mean anything unless you guys take it seriously right and so i gotta, I gotta send you some stuff that i think you would appreciate um so Whenever I had an operational partner, we came up with uh, Network Sales League. Oh, that's so cool. The, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, the network was the organization and Sales League. So basically we operated like the NFL and um, hmm. we had I love it. teams in different markets, you know, different divisions, stuff like that. We had a scoring system for the points, you know what I mean? And it was a 16 week season and a championship, you know what I'm saying? So it was like. You know, we, and we even did on a weekly basis, we did a, uh, a newscast or like a sports center type setup where we talked about the teams that were doing well and, you know, the, the rookies and the, the new, you know what I mean? Like we, we did it like a sports center sports cast, me and, uh, Ralph, my operational partner at the time, it was cool <laughs> as shit. I love you know? that. And we just, we just ran it like a football league. Yeah. You know? And uh, it, 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 I feel like it worked out really good. There was a lot of drama, you know what I mean? The point sure. system. And, you know, it was just like, anytime you do anything extra, like all of a sudden they give a crap about how you structure it and what's fair. You know what I mean? And you're like, right. I'm spending extra money on you. I'm right. doing that. Like, and you're complaining about how I'm doing it. Right. You know, there's actually so, uh, uh, this, so this game, uh, so this app gamify that you, yeah. you see it at the, uh, uh, at, yeah you know, the solar con. Um, so I'm did actually, you, did you purchase that? Yeah, I did. Dude, so they I'm, want the whole fee up front. Yeah. Well, year. yeah, that was, that was a little weird. And I told them the, I, I talked to them about that and, mm-hmm. and they ended up making something, you know, work, um, with me. But I, I told them, I said, that was like the one thing holding me back. And so we ended up making something it's work. Like you don't, it was really, I, I love the idea. My whole thing love, is proof, proof of concept. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll do it for 90 days. But I, I need to go through some proof of concept before I invest a whole year. I mean, that's just crazy for a, a software, you know? Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I mean, just like you were talking about, obviously the concept works. As long as the app work, works itself, like it works mm-hmm. with your CRM and works with all mm-hmm. that stuff, 
that's that's all that matters to me because yeah. if I'm not using it correctly, then that's my fault, right? Um, yeah. But I know that that concept works because you were just talking about how you had, you know, this NFL season type thing and, and that type of stuff works. The competitions, you know, anytime you can get somebody fired up because they're competing against each other, mm-hmm. that's the best way to do it. We're going to do stuff like March Madness next year um, where we're going to have like, like it's going to be people, yeah, right? I can send you some files on that too. Yeah, dude, it's going to be people. <laughs> I got a whole gonna, bracket. All yeah. you got to do is swap out your logo and you're good to go. <laughs> that's right. I love it. Yeah, so we're going to do all that stuff too. We're going to have a point system. If you set leads, uh-huh. get this. If you you know, if you know, uh, close deals and so whoever has the most points and then they go up to the next bracket, right? And then there's like upsets and it's it'd be pretty fun. So yeah. yeah. No, March Madness is something we've done for a long time and it it is. It's a lot of fun because it just, it breaks up the monotony. You know what I mean? Yeah. 100%. All right, guys, we got Jory Mack here on Building Great Sales Teams. He's in Apex Executives with me, and uh, he is a builder of sales teams. He's had a ton of success in the hardest of sales industries, mall kiosks, and door-to-door sales. He's the current owner of Reno Solar. And uh, Jory, appreciate you coming on to the show, man. Uh, you know, Thanks for having in me. terms of a guest that is specifically perfect for the show, you are one of those, you know what I mean? Cause sure. uh, you know, me and you trade information all the time and in our vet in, in almost the exact same industry. Uh, and you know, the only difference is I'm coming from the AT&T side, you come from the mall kiosk side, both had a lot of success in there. So, you know, definitely want to uh, hear about where it all started, you know what I mean? And you know how these things go. We want to hear the the origin story, you know what I mean? Where did Jory Mack come from? Sure. Well, um, yeah, no, that's, that's, it's, well, we can go really, really way back, but I, I'd actually rather just start where, where, um, kind of where in business. Right. Um, uh-huh. so basically what happened was, um, I was, uh, working for my family's pawn shop and, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, and we just didn't get along business wise. Um, and I wanted to maintain the relationship more than I did, um, wanted to actually inherit the business. Cause it's, you know, we, this is the, one of the biggest pawn shops in the West coast. So it's, it was a huge deal to walk away from, mm-hmm. uh, but I did, I walked away from it. Um, and so I you got were, a, you were heir to all this pawn shop business, basically. That's correct. Yeah. And, and I'm sure it did pretty well, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You just. You just decided up in one day and walk away from the whole thing. Will that ever come back around full circle? Uh, yes. You've been doing your own thing? Okay. Yeah. I'm actually in the pawn shop right now. <laughs> oh, okay. So if that tells you anything. Yeah. So yeah. it already did come back full circle. Um, uh-huh. So it's actually actually a funny story. So um, yeah, we basically didn't get along business-wise. Um, I was actually challenged. She pretty much told me, hey, um, uh, why, don't, why don't you go get a job and see see how you can see if you can treat your your employer the same way and see if you can keep your job type thing right for me um, me disagreeing with someone mm-hmm. is not uh, is not the same as being disobedient or being you know uh, uh, rude or anything like that um, I just state my disagreements and I want to make sure that people understand that like because I like, I think iron sharpens iron type thing, right? When mm-hmm. you actually bring up something that that is kind of hard for someone else to hear, like, hey, you're not doing this right. It's actually a good thing for someone to hear, even if it's hard to hear, right? And so she she kind of looked at it as a different um, style. They, she looked at it as like, hey, you know, you're being disobedient and stuff like that. So she says, hey, why don't you go get another job? See if you can talk to your uh, the CEO that way and, and see if you can keep your job. So I did. I went to go uh, work for a gym. Uh, I did talk to her the same exact way. I sat down with her, said, Hey, I think we could change some things up. I think we have some meetings every week, you know, that type of thing. Um, and we broke records eight out of 12 months. We broke nice. records and, and that business has been uh, there since 1978. So breaking a record is kind of a big deal. Um, I always you know talk I mean? about, I always talk about my first job or my first like 20 jobs. That's, that was always my problem. I always told the CEO how to do their job and it yeah. never worked out for me. And I was right. got fired. Yeah. So I'm glad they were receptive to you. Yeah. Well, I didn't ever, t- I never told her. I just said, Hey, listen, I have a lot of really good ideas and I'd like to implement them. What do you think? And she was like, you know what, go with it. You know, if it doesn't work, like let's just continue, let's move, you know, change it up. I said, okay, great. That's awesome. So I implemented it and it made a huge, huge difference. So, um, nice. yeah, so, so, and she always, we always got along great. I really, I loved that. She, her name's Dee Dee. She's amazing. So 
Um, so what happened was I actually started, I stopped by a kiosk in the mall and it said, stop, you know, back pain, neck pain. And I bought this little device and stuck it on my back and it uh, fixed my lower back. And I had been getting some back pain because I, you know, I was at the gym all the time, right? Yeah. I was, you know, swinging a racket for racket ball and, you know, I was playing, you know, softball and all these twisting sports. So I messed up my lower back. Um, and so I, uh, I fell in love with the device that fixed my lower back. Right. I was like, mm -hmm. dude, now I can play sports. That's a huge deal. Why isn't everybody using this thing? I've never seen this thing before. Right. Right. And so I started selling them at the gym. People would like pull their, you know, back or they you know, hurt their shoulder or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And I'd say, here, throw this on and it'd help them. And they'd go, where do I get one of these? And I said, Oh, well, I, I can sell you one. Right. So I just nice. started doing it and started, you know, building up some, and I would take all that money and put it into savings. And just every time I make a sale, I put in the savings, 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 mm -hmm. savings. And then I ended up buying a kiosk from the guy that originally sold it to me. So um, that being said, that uh, I had a rude awakening because what I thought is I thought I could change everybody's mind about the kiosks. Right. So when I went right. in, I was thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to be super aggressive. So I'm going to go and like, I'm just going to do it a different way and I'll probably get a lot more sales. Right. Um, what I realized is that it was, it was kind of a rude awakening. It has nothing to do with the person that's there. It just has to do with the thing in the middle of the mall. <laughs> Nobody, it doesn't matter how non-aggressive you are. It doesn't matter what, if the, the fact that you're even talking to somebody from a kiosk, they like, don't like you. Right? right. So what I had to realize is, okay, like it basically, first of all, broke down my entire fear of rejection. Uh, mm -hmm. I had to, I had to get to a point where I almost, I almost quit two weeks in, which is kind of wild because if I would have quit, I, none of this would have happened. Right. Um, but I almost quit two weeks in, uh, because I was like, I basically was like, well, this isn't, this wasn't the plan. My plan was to change the industry and to have people, you know, uh, you know, make it easier for people to walk up to me, not to like to turn into the kiosk salesman. Right. Right. Like I didn't want to be somebody who, who would stop people in the mall. <laughs> I didn't want yeah. that. And so what I realized is actually I had to, you know, I had to actually, um, I had to start stopping people. I, now I did come up with a lot of creative ways. I wasn't aggressive. I, you know, I try to figure out ways, you know, things like, like, oh, wow, nice shoes, you know, especially your left one. Right. And then the people, <laughs> people yeah. laugh and whatever it is. Right. So a little, just mm -hmm. little stuff that I could do to make people laugh. Right. Um, but what yeah. I realized is that people are, are, they just don't like the kiosk. So I step three feet this way and everybody likes me step three feet this way. Everybody, you know, doesn't like me anymore. Yeah, right? You're too close to the kiosk. Yeah. And that's what also broke that for me was I just mm -hmm. realized it's not me. It's this thing. Yeah. So I realized, okay, can't take it personally. Let's just continue to keep, you know, pushing and growing and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. uh, then the next step was, was building the team, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously building great sales teams, right? So this was yeah. for me, the, the second hardest part, because I was sitting there. Now I'm, I now understand it. I now know how to sell, but how do I get someone else? to buy into this, this, not only this product, but also this, this way of sales, right? Because mm -hmm. so many people don't like the kiosks. So when someone goes into the kiosks, now you have to change their mindset into this is your way of making money. And this is your way of, you know, you have, you're also helping people. So you have to, you have to create some sort of mission that was more important than what was, uh, than the fear that they had of the customers. Mm -hmm. So if you could help them, because they knew when they would make a sale that it would help their back or it would help their knee or it help their whatever it is. So they knew right. that. So if, if I could tell, teach them how important that was compared to the fear that they had, right. That mm -hmm. would make, that started to make the difference in the people too, um, was to let them know, Hey, hold on to those times where you fix someone's lower back or hold on to that time that that guy walked out. He walked in with a cane and walked out without a cane. You know what yeah. I mean? Hold on to yeah. those times. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, and then they, and when they did, they started to realize, okay, now I'm actually, now I'm actually, I'm doing something for the greater good. And even if I have to look like the turd that's stopping them in the mall, mm -hmm. once, once I make that sale, it's all worth it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to pull out a couple of points in there. 
And, yeah. you know, the first one is you were ready to quit two weeks in. Yeah. And at this point, were you, were you doing the sales or were you actually the owner of the kiosk when you talked about quitting two weeks in? Um, I, so that was, I was, um, I was doing my own sales, but mm -hmm. I was, I was, uh, I was kind of partners with the guy. Um, yeah. I was really the owner. Um, yeah. but I was buying, I was in the process of buying him out. Right. That makes sense. I got you. I'll put together a plan to, exactly. for you to take over basically. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, at that point you were, you were invested. So I guess when you were ready to quit, what made you show up the next day? Uh, that challenge, that challenge that my grandma gave me, it was, it was actually, I'll tell you, I was, I was actually writing out what I was going to say to my partner. I was actually mm -hmm. writing out, I was ready. I was, when I say I was ready to quit, I was literally yeah. ready to quit. I didn't, I was so over the rejection and everybody mm -hmm. saying, you know, I don't want to know, thank you, no, thank you. And then there, there are people like flip you off. There's people that like really are mean, right? Um, yeah. And so um, I was like, I, I just don't know if I can do this. And mm -hmm. I was writing out why. And I remember stopping halfway through. I was like, you know what? I can't quit. I can't quit. Cause if I quit, then my grandma's right. <laughs> right. Cause she also said that, that, okay, well now that you've, you've started, you know, um, this, you know, this is, is, or now that you've actually done well with the, the gym, yeah. let's see if you can start your own business. Right. It was right. So you challenge. Had a, you had a chip on your shoulder. Yeah. I had that chip on my shoulder and I had to get, I had to succeed. I just couldn't fail. And yeah. So, so that's the, that's the first thing I want to point out is, you know, a lot of times the motivation is a negative one. It comes from a negative place, right? Right. And for me, it was the same way. I had something to prove to myself and then to my family that I wasn't going to be like them, you know? So mm -hmm. every time I got into those situations where everything wasn't clicking and it seemed like the world was going to end type stuff, you know, I had to uh, kind of channel that and, to, and remind myself, hey, if I quit now, then then that person's right. <laughs> or... Um, then I don't, I don't get to be different from my family. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't get to trailblaze or any of that stuff. So right. uh, the, the next piece I would say is, well, and, and I believe in this wholeheartedly is you have to believe in your product, right? The fact that you came to the product as a customer, as a raving fan, that's huge. And then, and then so the first step is believing in your product. And then, like you said, create a mission around it. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're not even creating it. it. It's a very real and honest mission. That's right. You know what I'm saying to relieve people of pain and uh, something that has an instant satisfaction too, which is huge. You know, so many products that we sell don't, we don't get to see the results for months sure. or we don't get to see the savings or we, you know, we don't get to see the benefits for, for too long. And we have to sell them on um, getting them down the road, which, which becomes a little more difficult, but uh, and then of course you realizing that, Hey, I just need to change where I stand and where I talk to this person. And that can kind of open up the game for me, but none of that comes without actual pra practicing, you know what I'm saying? With, without actually getting the reps, yeah. that's the hardest thing that a lot of owners, especially with starting new divisions, new products, all that stuff. Like you got to get some reps in first in order to build out the program that is going to support your sales team. That's so, right. uh, no, I, that's awesome, man. And so in terms of, you know, going from your origin story to where you're at now, what kind of key things happened, you know what I mean? So from the kiosk, you know, obviously you got a mission behind your team and now did you open up multiple kiosks after that? Where did you go from there? Yeah. So, um, like I said, it was kind of, um, yeah, I probably wanted to quit maybe six or seven times um, throughout this whole yeah, time. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was but, yesterday for me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Every single time, though, I feel like I'm right next to gold. Mm -hmm. I'm right there. I'm just, I, I need to make that one little switch that I was afraid of stuff to make, of changing. Mm -hmm. And and then I make that little switch and it's just, boom, it explodes, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, one of them was actually opening, I opened up two more kiosks. Mm -hmm. um, I actually opened up a, uh, believe it or not, a, a makeup and a hair straightener kiosk. So uh, two, two things that I know nothing about, right? Being a straight male and not understanding anything about what, I didn't even know what Revlon was at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and yet I knew 
But one thing I did know is that the, the, uh, the product was good. I actually spent some time, you know, talking to customers that were already customers. Right. Yeah. Um, and go, okay, so you, so you really like it. Okay, cool. Like, you know, I knew that it was a good product. I asked them why, you know, there was, you know, lifetime warranty, there's certain stuff, right? So you was, weren't a uh, customer first to this product. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a customer first to this product. No. Um, but I knew it was a good product and I knew that if it was a good product and it was, there was a good market for it that I could sell it. Right. Uh-huh. Um, so, and I knew that it was, it made a lot of money. I was looking at the, the numbers and stuff. So, yeah. um, but when I bought the two kiosks, everybody quit. Right. And so that to me was so scary because I didn't know a lot about this kiosk. Right. And I didn't understand a lot about these products. Um, and yet everybody had left and it was just me and three kiosks in January. January, January is the worst time month for Kiosks. kiosks oh yeah <laughs> by far so, it's like a shopping hangover from the holidays yeah that makes sense yeah so and it's before you get your tax return exactly um, so what happened you had a mass exodus pretty much yeah so i you know looking back it wasn't it wasn't really me it was just the 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 fear of of change you know what mm-hmm. i mean the fear of change in leadership and so um me stepping in you know, I, I also think that um, I stepped into a, a different culture too. Um, it's mm-hmm. a very Israeli culture. And yeah. so um, there's, so when I stepped into it, um, I'll tell you a, a lot of times, uh, you know, with, with, I mean, in the kiosk world, um, mm-hmm. uh, Americans are actually really kind of looked down upon uh, yeah. as lazy, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, those, I, those kiosk workers are hustlers, man. Yeah. yeah. So when I stepped in, it, I didn't get a lot of respect mm-hmm. right off the bat. And so um, I actually ended up, so I ended up losing a lot of the guys, whether or not, you know, I was, I was working just as hard as they were, if not harder. Um, mm-hmm. But it just didn't, for them, it just, there wasn't the same respect that they had for the old leadership. Right. So they all left. Um, so I had to rebuild and I had to train and stuff like that. I was started with Craigslist, getting five people in there, talking to them, mm-hmm. getting them all going. You know, I that remember advertising like, oh. on Craigslist, man. <laughs> <That's> yeah, <nightmare. laughs> it was so hard. And getting it, getting them going, I, I'd get one for like three months and then they'd quit. And I just like, it was yeah. just so tr- tough. Turnover. Um, uh, and then actually uh, I ended up, uh, I ended up hiring. So actually Pedro and I um, ended up working. He actually managed all my oh, kiosks. Yeah. Yeah. So Pedro, uh, actually he, he managed my kiosks and he, uh, I actually found him, um, and another guy and we ended up working together a lot and he actually helped me, you know, grow it out. He had actually been in the industry for a little bit longer than I had. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was pretty awesome. And that's actually how we became like best friends too. Um, so that's, and that's, that's rare. Someone that worked for you at one point to end up being one of your best friends, you know? Yeah. He uh, actually, he actually gave me a two month notice first, first person ever. And probably the last one I'll ever get two month notice. Yeah, it's just that's like insane. a 1% rate of that ever happening in sales and commissions, yeah. especially, you know? Yeah. And he, he's, he, he actually is the reason why I joined apex as well. So really, really solid guy. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And so you got multiple kiosks now. Obviously you got them, you got people in, you got Pedro and uh, another person running them, you're rolling, yep. right? Was there a moment for you where it's like, all right, grandma, you know, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Actually, no. Um, what happened was, um, so I was, I, I kept growing them. Um, I also did the thing where I let Pedro kind of run them and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I stepped back thinking that I was like, okay, well, I can just now go do my own thing or whatever. Like I got a passive income, you know, like that whole thing of like, where you can, where you think you can just work for the beginning of, yeah. uh, you know, and then you can just let it go. Right. Yeah. And, but when you let it go, what happens? It starts going back downhill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, it turns out time. you were the secret sauce. You know? right and it <laughs> sucks because you're like oh man like you know and then yeah. and then because you, your 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 plan wasn't the same as what actually is happening so i realized well, the, i had to actually the, commit yeah, to the, the life of hard right yeah the first time you do it you know you think oh it's a person that's going to do it for me but it's not a person it's multiple people systems operations back ends you know what i mean like 
you have to have redundancies in place. You, you have to, they can't replace you. So, and, and, and not that they can't, but it's more like, well, if they can replace you, then they may as well be you. Right. They may as well go save up the money, open up their own kiosk and do their own thing. Right. Yeah. And so you've got to offer them something beyond that, which is, all right, I'll take, I've got the operations. I've got people backing you. I've got the accounting. I've got, you know what I mean? Cause this is, this is a sales org issue that happens a lot. You know, you get people that come up through the, the company and do well and then get in leadership roles and then they get into the key player role, you know, which is maybe minority partner, maybe profit sharing, you know, override, uh, some type of override over the whole company, that type of stuff. And then um, you start stepping back and then they feel like they're, they're the ones doing your job, you know what I'm saying, at the end of the day, right? right? So you have to put the operational people in place to support them so they have, you know, three or four people that are, they're still the leader, but they have a support team that you employ, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so they have a, re okay, I can go deal with all this myself that, that Jory has to deal with, or I can just do what I'm good at and make a sure. bunch of money. And you know what I mean? If we, and if we don't profit, it's not me that's got to worry about it. It's Jory that has to worry about it, you know? So you're the money, you're the operations, you're the back end, and you're yep. the vision. 100%. You know, and that's important. Yeah, and that's otherwise, the, otherwise, then they can just go and do everything themselves if they, if they are doing it themselves, right? Right. Yeah, 100%. No, that's actually, uh, um, that's really well put. I'll tell you, it's, it's you want to you wanna build a team, right? You want to build not just a player. You know, there's not, you know, Kobe Bryant didn't do it by himself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He did it by, by building up a team around him and same yeah. thing with, you know, Stephen Curry and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, the other thing that, um, so then, yeah, let's, then let's kind of go into how this all happened. So mm -hmm. uh, basically COVID happened actually, um, and it shut down all the kiosks and the malls. Um, and you, you went from a. Uh... You know, at, at this point, what, how much in sales were you guys doing? We had, so we had 10 kiosks. We were doing, uh, we were doing over, I mean, we were doing uh, a decent amount over a million a year okay. uh, in sales. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say 1.5 or something like that in sales. Um, so pre COVID you go from 1.5 million a year or, um, was it come out to like uh, 200, 300,000 a month? Or I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about off there. 150 uh, yeah. a month. Right? Yeah, 125 a month ish. Yeah, 125 a month to zero because they shut down all the kiosks and everything. There's no insurance for that, right? I mean, there's just zero income all of a sudden. Your yep. people are out of jobs, your leadership is out of their positions. You in know fact, I even had the insurance that you're supposed to be able to use that with. And, uh, and mm -hmm. they said that there's the one little thing that says viruses don't aren't included. So yeah. there's a, how could you not read the 3000 page, page thing? Contracts? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So and not see that coming. <laughs> yeah. It was really frustrating actually. And we ended up, uh, um, so we lost all that income mm -hmm. and I still had to pay because I, I had rent. The, well, yeah, I had, I so plus I actually housed my guys and I also gave them, uh, what's it called? I gave them, you know, cars and stuff like that. So I had to yeah. pay for insurance, cars, rents, like all that stuff, everything. Right. And mm -hmm. eventually, so I'll tell you the first two weeks was like the best two weeks of my life. No employees calling me. I'm playing video games, whatever. Right. Yeah. I will tell you that third week I was like, I need to figure something out. And that's actually yeah. how the solar company came about was I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I need to figure this out somehow. And so I sat down and just went over, what do I do here? And I had been looking into solar for a long time mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And I had, I have a phone repair shop and stuff like that too, but the phone repair shop was even, you know, not doing very yeah. good during that Same time. Thing. So. It's retail. Yeah. Yep. So it was, it was a, um, it was pretty much, I had to figure something out that was quote unquote essential, which essential is garbage in my personal opinion, because everybody needs money to yeah. eat. Right. And so yeah. that's, that's essential, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, that's a nonsense. But the thing is, is that just having, you had to figure out something that the government deemed essential, which was solar, right. you know, uh, energy sector was still, still essential. Um, so we were still, we were still knocking doors and still doing it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, 
yeah. And then they all, they all joined the solar company. We all made some decent money. And then mm -hmm. uh, we went back, they all went back to the kiosks and uh, I just fell in love with the, the business and kept going from there. So that's interesting uh, going from a kiosk and probably making, I'm just spitballing here, 20 to a hundred dollars per sale mm -hmm. commission. Um, and then going into solar, making some money there and then going back to the kiosk because the solar commission, that's a high ticket item. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So I guess what made them go back? Were they not able to get past that like setter deal it, or? No, it was really just it's it's comfort zone. Right. Once Ultra. they've broken that that mindset of like, you know, of being in the kiosk, you know, then it becomes mm -hmm. a comfort zone. Right. Yeah. Now you're now knocking doors is out of the comfort zone. So they're like, oh, I don't really like this as much. This is, you know, so they had to get through that, that breaking that barrier. And there's only like two people that really broke that barrier. They were like, they were like, actually, I want to stay in solar. So everybody else wanted to go back to the kiosk. You know, I don't look at a lot of sales positions and say, hey, that's harder than door to door. But I feel like kiosk is right there, if not harder. <laughs> it's definitely harder. Yeah. <laughs> in my, in my personal, oh, yeah. In my yeah. personal opinion, it is way harder and for less money, in my opinion, too. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Well, don't get me wrong. There are some oh, wait, people, wait, my guys are listening to this. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, that's right. <laughs> just you know, there's some people that make really good money in the kiosk. Yeah. So there's you have to be pretty good at it to make really good mm -hmm. money on it. Um, but uh, I'll tell you, at the, for the most part, if you're just okay at it, you'd be better off okay at at, at solar um, solar yeah. than okay in the kiosk. If gotcha. you're good in the kiosks, then you can stay there. <laughs> okay. You can make a lot of money. So just to wrap up the kiosk business, what would you say? kind of made you, I mean, I'm sure you ran into people recruiting your people. I'm sure you ran into, you know, competitive offers and stuff like that. What would you say kind of was the difference maker for you? And I know this is a tough question, but if you could just grab one thing in culture. terms of culture. Yeah. I mean, that's what it, a lot of it comes back to, but uh, tell me, tell me more about y'all's culture and what you kind of focused on at that time versus what we know now with Apex and Reno Solar and, you know, everything yeah. you got going on now. I would say um, we were about average um, on the amount of, of, of commission that we gave. Um, there was always somebody who was willing to give more, right? right. Um, and for us, uh, we were totally okay with that. And, uh, and we had, you know, we, we had certain things where we're like, hey, this is just how it is um, if you want to come work for us. Um, you know, and people would leave these, these higher percentage, you know, positions to come work for us because we had such a good culture, you know, we would get rid of the turds. You know, there's a lot of the, the, a lot of times they'll keep the, the top salesman, you know, just because he's putting up, you know, by himself, a hundred thousand dollars a month. Right. Mm -hmm. And they just want to, you know, they just want to keep that guy yeah. and yet it destroys the whole culture. Mm -hmm. um, and now they have all the, they have all the control. Power. Yeah. And I wasn't willing to have that. I wanted to have, a bunch of people that were that could work together as a team, mm -hmm. um, and so we'd get rid of the bad ones, and uh, and we have we have a culture of accountability, but we also have a culture of and and that's important. That's important mm -hmm. to, to for people to be held accountable is is in my personal opinion is uh, is just as vital as a motivating uh, culture because mm -hmm. what happens is if somebody feels like they can kind of be lazy and get away with it. That's the natural course of action for people. That's yeah. natural. They want to do that. They want to go like, okay, well, if I can, if I can take the easy way then I will. And How so do I you, make more money doing less work. Exactly. And, yeah. and efficiency is important, right? So like mm -hmm. making more money with less work efficient wise is good, but laziness is not right. Mm -hmm. And so the way that, uh, the way that we, really started holding people accountable in the way that we really started, um, uh, you know, training and building a team and, and working that culture. Um, I'll tell you, people were like, I mean, they're now after COVID, we're like breaking down our door to, to try to come work for us. Um, mm -hmm. And it turned into a really great culture and a really great, and then, and then everybody was making so much money because you wouldn't have those days where these two got in a spat and they got pissed off and then nobody made money that day. Right. right. So they, so because the culture was so good, everybody's paychecks were a lot better. Mm -hmm. And even if they were on an average, you know, uh, you know, percentage or whatever it was, 
they still were making a lot more money because everybody was working together and they were all helping each other out. It was really great. What was one thing y'all did to drive that culture, to drive a good culture? I mean, you, you talked about getting rid of the cancers. That's one thing. Uh, what's another thing? Truly just caring for the people. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when someone, when someone needed something, um, you know, there's, there's times that people really need some help or, or, Hey, you know, uh, Hey, I got myself in a bind, you know, could you, could you help me out here? And, uh, you know, being really there for them and really helping them, um, mm -hmm. knowing that they, that, that they have a safety net with you and that they have, that somebody's going to back them and that's going to help them out. And, um, that's really invested in their success is really important. The, the, the really caring for the people is something that not people, people don't really feel in their work environment. They're usually felt as, as a number in a lot of ways. Right. And, uh, and when you really care about them and their success, that's what I've noticed is that I care more about someone else's success, which makes me more successful. Absolutely. Right. So if, if I'm pushing as hard as I can to make you successful, to make you money, to make you pay your bills and, and, and hit your why and your goals and all that stuff, then eventually now I'm, I'm also making it too, but my focus isn't on me. It's on you. Yeah. And here's, here's a concept too, is that, you know, that's a genuine thing all the way through in terms of like, there has been times where I made a decision that made other people in the, the organization more successful. Right. And I, you know, I, I understand that that's naturally going to happen over the course of time, right? You're going to become more successful, you know, the, uh, the more successful people that you not create, but you foster, yeah. um, and you provide an opportunity with the more successful your business will become, but it, it doesn't always happen that way. And, and even the medium term, I should say, not short term, not long term, but like the halfway term. And so if you're still I don't know why the last year I've been super comfortable making a hundred grand a year. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Obviously I've made more than that, but as long as I'm at that low point, you know what I'm saying? I will reinvest back into the business. Sure. When I don't have a project going on, I don't want to put a new garage in my house. You know what I mean? That, that type of stuff. Right. I have that when I think it's necessary, but, and I feel like if you truly if your passion is truly creating this vision, this legacy, you know what I'm saying? It's easy to just completely overlook it. And then all of a sudden you look up and my MDU director just made seven grand in a week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, my VP of sales has made over 10 grand in a week, you know? And so it's like, I haven't done that this year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But I mean, there it, that's the whole thing about sales. You can always make more than your boss. Right. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, there was no, you know, most people would have resentment. Can you most say that people, again, really loud for the yeah, people in the back? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the great thing about sales. You make more, you can make more money than your boss, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Cause they, they don't realize that either. Right. They think, Oh, I made 10 grand. Doug must've made 11. You know right. what I mean? Exactly. He's always got to make a dollar more. No, that's not how it works. They don't realize because, all the costs that go into it and all the risk and all the other stuff. Well, even it. beyond that, it's irresponsible of me to pay myself based on your income. You know what I'm saying? Right. I need to pay myself based on a salary that I predetermine and then make, you know, uh, distributions whenever I, I feel necessary. You know what I'm saying? I know that that coffer is always there. Sure. I need to go into it and say, Hey, I want to, you know, get the wife a new, uh, expedition or whatever the case is, you know? Sure. And so anyways, but I just, you know, and that's one of the things that apex and being around guys like you and the rest of our crew has really done for me is just kind of opened my mind up to that. And it's like, man, that's where I'm getting my fulfillment from is creating an opportunity, seeing other people execute on it and being the example, you know, yep. in, in, in terms of the rest of our lives. Well, let's, uh, cause we're running out of time quick. I don't know how we got this far already, but, uh, yeah, we're good. Let's get into, um, what you're doing now. And, you know, in terms of what you did well with the kiosk and, and the culture and everything, you've got, you've got solar right now. You've, you still got kiosk, right? Yeah. I still got the okay. kiosk. You've got, uh, you're at your family's pawn shop business. You've got the solar tax program. Is, is there a company name for that? Solar tax, solar tax consultants. Okay. I thought it was something simple like that. Yeah. That's why I didn't remember, you know what I mean? But solar tax consultants. 
And then, and then what else you got going on? I know you got something else. <laughs> yeah. I've got a, a garage door com- or a repair company in South Carolina okay. and okay. A, <laughs> a carpet cleaning business here. Um, a phone repair, like I said, uh, uh-huh. and I'm actually, believe it or not, as, as crazy as you probably think I am, um, pretty soon here, I'm going to be opening a, uh, uh, air duct cleaning business as well. No, that's actually perfect. I mean, anything to do with home services. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, in Denver. Yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense, you know, because yeah. you can, you can sell the products on top of each other, even if they are different companies structured differently, different salespeople, you're basically collecting data when you make yep. a sale, you know what I'm saying? And now you can advertise that data to, to, yep. uh, for your other home service things. So no, that's great. Um, so that's like seven or eight different businesses. Yeah. Now it's a lot. <laughs> are they, are they all like, do they all have operators in place? You know what I mean? How are you managing that? I all, I always make sure that I have an operator in place, but, um, mm-hmm. before I do something like this. So, um, uh, my my whole thing to people is that hey I will help you build it right mm-hmm. I will take you know I understand the building blocks of a business really well especially with all these different you know businesses once you realize that all businesses are similar in a lot of ways they yeah. just you just need to learn this the the few things that go into it that are different right mm-hmm. there's I mean at the end of the day every industry is leads closing fulfillment. Mm-hmm. every single one of them right so you just have to how do you get the leads how do you uh uh, uh how do you close them right mm-hmm. and and how do you fulfill it right once you break it down to that now i can help build that part for them mm-hmm. but they need to do the day-to-day work i can't do the day-to-day work right so that's where um you know that's where actually it works out really well too is that you know people that have more time on their hands um you know, look to me for some, for some help um, mm-hmm. because they don't know how to start a business. They don't know what to do. Right. right. And so I have all that. I have the background. I have the you know experience in the marketing. I have the guys that can do it. I have the, you know, the support team, all that stuff. And then they can do the front end. I understand how to close, you know, to clean air ducts and how to close it and how to do that stuff. Right. If they know how to right. do the front end stuff, then I can help them with all the back end. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, what would you say is your golden goose right now? Is it solar? Because solar you know, for sure. Yeah, that's what 100%. I. Yeah, that's, that's what I even. figure because that's what you're in every day. Yep. You know, so you're the operator in that business pretty much. Yeah, I do have an operator in this business too. So mm-hmm. I've got uh, a guy. He's he's my executive director. He's phenomenal. He's awesome. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I've got and honestly, I've I've even had you know my office girl was you know when I got COVID you know, yeah. drawer, my executive director wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, I was out for a whole month and, and Steph took care of a lot of that. So, um, I, I have multiple people that can help me. Um, if let's say I were to leave for a month. Right. Right. But yeah. at the same time, like you said, golden goose, I want to put mm-hmm. my time where it's the most valuable. Right. right. You're going to get the, the biggest, uh, ROI. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, that doesn't mean that I don't care about the other businesses. I do care yeah. about them a lot. And if there was something to go downhill or something like that, I would catch it and I would take the time to, to, to work. Right. On it. But that being said, uh, it would be silly for me to put all my time and effort into a business that's not bringing me or bringing me a quarter of what the rest is. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So how, uh, how is your team structured right now in terms of leadership? You know, so, you got your, are you, are you, I can't remember, are you doing the set or closer model? Yes. Yeah, so it's, okay. uh, so it's me, um, mm-hmm. executive director. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a marketing guy. I've got mm-hmm. a, uh, I've got my, uh, my bookkeeper, good bookkeeper, who's mm-hmm. kind of a borderline CFO too. Um, yeah. Then I've got my, uh, I've got a lead coordinator mm-hmm. who takes care of all the inbound leads um, and making sure that she's setting the leads. I've got a, um, uh, an office administrator. She takes care of all the, the project type stuff. Um, she was taking care of a lot of the uh, Dude, uh, that's, spreadsheets. That's a stressful position. <laughs> yeah. But project yeah. management. Yeah. So the spreadsheets is um, I actually just got a project manager because um, we're doing our own installs, but the spreadsheets that she mm-hmm. was doing, she was doing tons of spreadsheets. Now I'm actually getting rid of that part for, for her because she uh, we're getting a new CRM. Yeah. Um, and Sam Cahayas is building out her CRM and I'll be honest with you, he's a stud. Um, I can't, I can't wait until I can call him and say, Hey, 
this is my vision, make it happen. Yep. Because I'm getting, I'm getting to that point, but I need, I need more sales coming through the company before I do that. Not, not for the cost, but for, to understand how I want it all to work together. Yep. But I, I, I truly believe I'm going to pay him to do a custom CRM build. I don't want to use go high level. I don't want to use somebody else's platform. I want it built from scratch. Yeah, I'm he, tired of like having to adjust for these other companies to tell me how they're going to do my uh, sales flow. You know, sure. it's driving me nuts. But he does, he does have go high level as well. He has, he, mm -hmm. but he, he chooses based upon, he, like we're using monday.com and go high mm -hmm. level. Um, gotcha. So we're using basically uh, Michael Copeland's um, go high yeah. level part where he basically has, has an automated process of right. uh, texting and stuff like that. And then we also mm -hmm. have the, the monday.com part too. And they all are going to be talking to each other because yeah. of Sam, right? Yeah. Uh, because Sam, Sam sets it up to where, where, you know, solo is, is, you know, like Quativa for you would be connected mm -hmm. to, to go high level, which would be connected. If you wanted to do installs, monday.com would be a good thing. Yeah. If not just go high level and, and, uh, Quativa, but they would talk to each other. So now you've, you, now when you close the deal, boom, it goes right into the, 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 it, it moves them to the next column. So you don't have to worry about it. Right. Yeah. Um, and it adds the amount and all that stuff in there. So you're basically, you're hands off for the most mm -hmm. part, you know? No, that's great. Yeah. And that's, that's super essential. You know, I talk about, uh, operations in the Kodak system all the time and operations. If you can't fulfill your projects, if you can't give your salesman visibility to the products, project stages and stuff like that, if you can't do it fluidly, you're going to have a hard time maintaining your sales team. So yeah. sp speaking of that, uh, let's go through the rest of that build. Right. Okay. So, uh, you've got your operational team in place, your staff, and then, and then, uh, how's your sales team built out? We've got our, our, um, closer model. Uh, mm -hmm. what is it called? And then we've got, uh, so we've got center closer. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically they work, obviously the set, the setters go out, um, and they set their, um, they set the leads and they, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, they get the bill, they get a, you know, five-star lead, stuff like that. If they sit, um, they get commission. Then they also, if they close, right. they get commission. Right. Um, yeah. and then we also have the closers, um, that go in and actually, um, and we call them, uh, pros and techs too, by the way. Mm -hmm. So we don't call them setters and closers. Uh, right. reason being is because part of it's also, if you, if you're talking to a customer, you don't want to say, Hey, yeah, we're going to yeah. send over our clothes. We're sending over our tech. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We have, uh, we have a different, uh, different name for the cu customer facing stuff. That's more for our back end to yeah. understand who gets paid where and all that good stuff. Exactly. But yeah, no, I, I did that way back in the at t days, you know, um, uh, at t specialist or, you know, right. Uh, area manager, regional manager, you know, all that type of stuff. But on, on our end, it was just sales rep. You know? Right. Exactly. So what's exactly. working, what's working for Reno solar right now? Uh, what do you mean? What's working? So, I mean, they're all, it's all working right now, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> I don't know. It really is. It's, it's, so you been... guys are, you guys are doing two sales a day. You know, when you and I talked a couple of months ago, you know, that was more like a week, right? Yeah. It was like three, four a week. That was about right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now it's. And so what do y'all, what's been the catalyst for that, that transition? I think the competition was a big thing. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that, uh, you know, me having this as executive director, it's firing everybody else up too, because now we've got two of me really. I mean, yeah. this guy's like, he really is like a me. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he's, he's like your sales manager, but he also sees the whole business. Exactly. You know what I'm saying and how it should work together. And he helps a lot with actually being able to take the calls and help close the deals and stuff like that too. So yeah. I can actually be on the floor, on the ground. Cause I love mm -hmm. to knock doors. Not everybody loves to knock doors, right? Yeah. He, 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 that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to build out the back end stuff. I'm the exact opposite. I hate the back end stuff. I hate administrative paperwork yeah. and nonsense. I can't stand it. I'd rather be uh -huh. out there talking to people, knocking on doors, you know, closing deals. I like that stuff. Get me uh -huh. out of the office and, and I'm, I thrive and I have more fun. Um, yeah. And he, he, he's the exact opposite. So it works out perfect. He, and he's a great salesman. So he can help mm -hmm. with the calls and stuff but I can be on the floor and it just is a perfect, you know, yin and yang. Yeah. And that, that's good to have that awareness too, about yeah. what you genuinely enjoy and being willing to put someone, you know, when you look at, when you make a sale out in the field, you know what I mean? When you're making that sale, 
I mean, in that hierarchy, you're a closer, right? And right. he's he's the manager, you know what right. I'm saying? Which yeah. which makes no sense when you look at who owns the company, right? <laughs> but that's what you enjoy doing. Yeah. And I and I think you're 100 percent correct. If you enjoy rain making, then rain make rain. You know, <laughs> like that's right. That's awesome, man. And I think I think me, I think it also fires people up the fact that the owners out there knocking doors because people yeah. look at that as like a like a like entry level thing. And mm-hmm. for me, it's it's not entry level. I, I I feel like wow, you have to do it in order to make money. You know what I mean? You have to yeah. get leads. Leads turn into sales right and mm-hmm. the thing is is that at the end of the day if you don't have people to talk to you won't be helping them go solar right right so Absolutely. you have to knock doors to help them go solar that's the way mm-hmm. that's the way it works you know <laughs> so for me it's like i love it you know i enjoy it and so the more i do it the more people get fired up and want to do it also yeah absolutely and so tell me about the the sales mindset okay. so this is obviously you know, you, you came to our office and did some training for us here and you went through some of this. So, you know, obviously we got to do the abridged version, but this yeah, is sure. something that I feel like you're working on and that you're going to do talks on someday. Right. Yeah, I, I okay. agree. Um, really what it comes down to is, um, is you, I feel like you have complete control over your mind. Mm-hmm. I think people, um, a lot of times they think that like, for example, I, there's a lot of people that say things like, well, I'm, I'm not good at names, right? Oh, I suck at names. Mm-hmm. Well, you're going to consistently suck at names the more that you keep saying that, right? The more that if, if you start to say, okay, I'm changing that about myself, I'm now going to start being intentional every single time I walk it to somebody and talk to them and, and ask them their name, I'm going to say it three times so that I can remember their name, mm-hmm. right? Now, all of a sudden, my mindset changes. You don't suck at names. That's something that's just something that people say, right? Mm-hmm. Because they've given in to the, their, their own, you know, like basically laziness on, on, yeah. on remembering someone's name. It's the, it's the bullshit story you're telling yourself. Exactly. The same exact thing happens in sales mm-hmm. where people, I don't like knocking doors. Well, change that about yourself, right? You can change that about yourself. You can actually start to like knocking doors. I'll tell you, I didn't like kiosks. But I'll tell you, mm-hmm. I didn't want to leave at the end of it because it was fun. I had a good time. I felt like every time I'd stop somebody, it was another challenge, right? Mm-hmm. Just even trying to stop somebody is a challenge, right? So the thing is, is it became a completely different mindset of like, I'm now challenging myself every single day and getting better and, and building character. And there's all this stuff. So I mm-hmm. look at it as a challenge. Like somebody just said a couple of days ago, they were like, they're like, oh man, I hate knocking in the cold. I'm like, I love knocking on the cold. I'd rather knock in the cold than knock in, in, in the warm because I know that I'm building character. I know that now I like it takes a real, you know, a, 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 someone who has grit to knock in the cold. Mm-hmm. I want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that's a fair weather, you know, knocker, right? So, so what, is, what is the strategy for reframing your mind that way? Because we're, just, we're, not, we're not just talking about sales now. Yeah. I mean, this is anything you don't like doing. Exactly. It's, it's, basically telling yourself every single day and rewiring your own mind. And part of that is basically when you hear, you know, like they say the, the, you know, that voice, right. That voice in your inner bitch. Yeah. That voice. (laughs) You can cuss for me. That's okay. Yeah. 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 It's an explicit podcast. We're good. I know, but I don't cuss anyway. But so the the whole thing is that what it comes down to is the, um, is that that voice, if you, you can, if you rewire it enough times, eventually that's what you believe, right? Mm-hmm. You're, if you believe something and I, if like for me, I believe that knocking doors is actually something that's going to help people. So if I start to believe that and I start to tell mm-hmm. myself that, so every time that I'm, I'm going against that feeling of like, ah, I don't want to go to that next door. Oh, I got shut down six times. Oh, the, you know, all that stuff that's like in your head, right? Yeah. It's who cares? I'm helping somebody, right? That's all, whatever. They just didn't know that they needed help, right? Mm-hmm. So they, that's why they shut me down, right? That's it. So once you start to rewire your mind that way, you start to think mm-hmm. from a different perspective and you consistently hit that, that you consistently rewire it. Eventually it is rewired and you, you, you no longer have to, to do it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? You no longer, it doesn't take any effort. It takes a lot of effort at the beginning. I don't know if you heard about myelin. Do you know what myelin is? 
basically myelin is a pathways in the brain that are built from habits. Oh, so when, yes. So I've heard this explained before. I didn't know there was a name for it. Yeah, it's actually so. Um, so that's why think about it from this perspective. What's the difference between going to the gym the first time and going to the gym the 500th time? There's no difference, right? Mm -hmm. In the actions themselves, there's no difference. Right. But why does it hurt so much more in your mind to go the first time? Because that, myelin, created that pathway, exactly. You haven't created that pathway. So you're actually breaking down something in your brain and it sucks. Mm -hmm. And then when you're rewiring it and changing it to something else, you're actually rebuilding something that's actually legitimate pathways in your brain. So when you're building that, it's tough, it's hard, but once you've already built it, now you just go to the gym. That's just who I am. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So it's the same thing with sales. If you consistently keep doing that and you consistently keep rewiring your brain to like, man, this sucks to like, I actually really love this. Eventually you just start to love it. So if, you know, and I agree with you hundred percent, that's why I wake up at four 30 in the morning now, you know, yeah. the first time I did it, I didn't have that pathway. Right. You know what I mean? Now I have that pathway. Right. On uh, 100%. How do the listeners get a hold of you if they, they want to learn more about the sales mindset? Um, honestly, or any I'm, of your 17 products that you have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm down to just if somebody wants to text me, um, I, I don't call me because I, I, I'm really hard to get a hold of. I'm always busy, mm -hmm. but text me 775-846-9371. Um, um, and I mean, I'm always down to have conversation. I like to help people out. That's actually one of my biggest passions. So is helping others. So. Awesome. And we can also find you on Facebook at yep. Jory, Jory Dane, Dane Mac. Mac. Yep. Yeah. And that's D A I N E. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jory, uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. I knew this would be a really good one. I think our listeners can get a ton of value from it. And so yep. I'm excited to get the feedback from it and everything. And, uh, we'll put all Jory's info in the show notes, uh, cool. guys, I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you got a lot of value from this and let's get building. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Building Great Sales Teams. Be sure to appreciate it. If you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you consume podcasts. This way you'll get notifications as new episodes become available. Remember, great sales teams are not recruited. They are built block by block. Until next time.